Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us once again. Uh, once more, we're looking at some of the small books in the Bible. And we're going to look at the book of Obadiah, just one chapter, 26 wow. verses, 21 verses, uh, not very many. Let's go to verse 10. Let's start there. It's a coming judgments upon Edom. Edom was the descendants of Esau. So it starts here in verse 10. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. In the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. But you should not have gazed on the days of your brother in the days of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should, have, you should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Is this a message that says, be kind to your neighbor? It certainly sounds a lot like that, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, here's brothers. I mean, these yeah. are descendants of brothers, twin brothers. Yeah. And they should have been nice to each other, but they were perpetual enemies. They never grew out of the sibling rivalry state, you know, and it went, went on. Um, apparently, if you look at, if you compare the book of, small book of Obadiah here with, with um, Jeremiah chapter 49, it looks like either one borrowed from the other or possibly both of them borrowed material from, a, from an earlier source. So we, we believe that this Obadiah probably lived round about the time of Jeremiah and probably as the children of Israel were being taken off into captivity one of the three times when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. So, um, and God says, and, and apparently the, the Edomites who at that time lived up on Mount Edom and, and in the place we now call Petra, they felt like they were safe, that nobody could get to them, and they're standing there sort of laughing as the Israelites are being, being conquered and, and dragged off into, into Babylonian captivity. And this book is largely a, a, a comment to them, which reminds us of other books we've had. Can you, think of, can you name another book that uh, is coming up pretty soon that is addressed, in fact, two books that are addressed primarily to other nations and not to Israel? Jonah. Jonah is an excellent example, yes. And later, Nahum talks about Nineveh as well. So here, Obadiah is almost exclusively uh, talking about Edom. So here's three books in this short section of, of the Old Testament that are primarily focused at other nations, for good or for bad. Um, look at Obadiah 15. The day is near. Is that kind of like the day of the Lord? When I, the Lord, will judge all nations, Edom, what you have done will be done to you. You will get back what you have given. Is that, um, that's not like the, the, the golden rule? Or is this golden rule in reverse? I will, I will, I will let you have it just like you had let other people have it, right? What mother hasn't said to her two sons, if she has two, stop hitting your brother. If you don't want him to hit you, don't hit him, right? Case of as you sow, you reap. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's another, there's two or three verses here in Obadiah that are, that are very interesting. 
um, that one about about and and I, I would hear love to hear any of the rest of you comment about that rule. Is this is is the is, the, is this the the opposite of the golden rule in the Old Testament? What do you what do you think that really says? Well, we have a modern slang term that represents this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And look at verse 16. That's another interesting verse. My people have drunk a bitter cup of punishment on my sacred hill, but all the surrounding nations will drink a still more bitter cup of punishment. They will drink it and vanish away. And if you read the more literal translations, it will see they will become as if they had never existed. That's the, that's the New American Standard Bible. What does it mean they will become as, they, as if they had never existed? What do you think that means? There wouldn't even be any memory of them. I think it's also one of the worst things that could happen if a person's... Mm -hmm. they were, they were you can never find any evidence of them. Just what it says. Mm -hmm. Just what it says. And when will that take place? The day, after the day of the Lord, maybe. Verse 15, the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. I've heard people interpret that, that they won't even be put to judgment, that they will just just fade away as if they never were. Is that, what do you think of that interpretation? Look at Malachi 4 and see if, if, if you think this fits. Malachi 4, this is the last chapter in the Old Testament, and I'm going to read, it's only six verses, I'm going to read the whole thing. The Lord Almighty says in my, the title for my chapter here says, The Day of the Lord is Coming. The Lord Almighty says, The day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw. For those of you who dealt with horses and cattle and dealt with straw, what is straw? Dry hay. Dead grass. It's the dead stalks of, of car, for example, wheat. Here's a, here's a stalk. You cut off the head and, and harvest the grain, thrash it, etc. And the dead stalk is just a, and what what's left over when you burn a burn hay? Not much. Not Almost not much. nothing. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. On that day, they will burn up, and there will be nothing left of them. Does that sound like Obadiah? So it sounds like all these people that Obadiah is talking about is all the wicked. At least that's a possible application. Yeah, it says, but and still reading on from Malachi. But for you who obey me, my saving power will rise, up you, rise on you like the sun and bring healing at the sun's rays. So the righteous will be blessed by this power, this Son of God, the S-U-N of God, not the S-O-N of God. And, but the wicked, what will happen to them? They will be consumed. Going back to the righteous, you will be happy, be as free and happy as calves let out of a stall. On the day when I act, you will overcome the wicked, and they will be like dust under your feet. How much is left of them? How does this fit with the idea of an eternally burning hell? It no compute. It doesn't. it doesn't compute, huh? So here's, here in Obadiah and here in Malachi are a couple of verses that really don't fit with the idea of eternally burning hell. On that day when I act, you will overcome the wicked, and they will be like dust under your feet. Nothing but dust. Remember the teachings of my servant Moses and laws and commands which I gave him at Mount Sinai for all the people of Israel to obey. But before the great and terrible day of the Lord, now we've expanded that title a little bit, comes, I will send the prophet Elijah. He will bring fathers and children together again. Otherwise, I would have to come and destroy your country. Um, then at the end of Obadiah, we find something which is similar to what we find at the end of a lot of the little small books in the Old Testament, some encouraging words. Look at these and, and see what you think. But on Mount Zion, some will escape. Where's Mount Zion? Jerusalem. Next to Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, next to the temple, yes. And it will be a sacred place. The people of Jacob will possess the land that is theirs by right. The people of Jacob and of Joseph will be like fire. They will destroy the people of Esau as fire burns stubble. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? No descendant of Esau will survive. I, the Lord, have spoken. By the way, in the headquarters there 
in Edom, in Petra. How many people live there today? Nobody. None. Nobody. Not one. Okay? People from southern Judah will occupy Edom. Those from the western foothills will capture Philistia. Israelites will possess the territory of Ephraim and Samaria. The people of Benjamin will take Gilead. The army of exiles from northern Israel will return and conquer Phoenicia as far north as Zarephath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sardis will capture the towns of southern Judah. The victorious men of Jerusalem will attack Edom and rule over it, and the Lord himself will be king. Is that a good way to end a little book like this? The Lord himself will be king. What does that imply? Is this going to be a good time, a bad time? Uh, well, it's the final end. Yeah. Uh, how things are going to work out. Good for the good, and it's not so good yeah. for the bad. I see. <laughs> well, there's an interesting verse at the end of Isaiah we talked a little bit about, but let's turn back to it. The very last verse, the last two or three verses in Isaiah, see how that fits in. I will start reading from verse 22. Isaiah 66, starting with verse 22. Just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of those who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting to all people. Now, in Obadiah and Micah, we said there will be, there'll be nothing left of them. Here it says the fire and whatever will never go out. How do we put those two together? You're all supposed to be experts in Scripture now. <laughs> well, well, the, the results well, of it is never going to go out. The results is... The results. Yeah, the results of it is not going to go out. It isn't going to change. Mm -hmm. It's... It's going to happen. I mean, it'll be there forever. And the fire, you can't put it out until it's done. We're seeing more and more fires like that in our day. Some yeah. of these huge forest fires, basically, they can burn around them and try to limit the amount of space they spread to, but can't they just it. say, you know, let it burn itself out, right? Or as he uses the word quenched, which mm -hmm. implies like you, you can't put enough water on it to stop it. But, what, but where is the, and they shall go forth and look? What's that? Verse 24. They yeah. Look at the dead bodies. Yeah. I, th I think that what's going to happen here is that the new Jerusalem at the third coming, the, wick the righteous are going to be inside, and they're going to be able to see out there as the wicked perish. And they're going to be like straw. They're going to be consumed. There's going to be nothing left of them. I, I think that's pretty clear. And the, people, and the people in the New Jerusalem will weep just as God will weep as his children uh, die. And the verse you have for that, well, let me read a couple. Ezekiel 18, 32, for example, I do not want anyone die, to die, says the Lord, sovereign Lord. Turn away from your sins and live. Of course, that's my good news translation. And then maybe the most famous of all is found in Hosea 11, verses 7, 8. My people are bent on turning away from me. The yoke is all they are fit for. I can love them no more. How, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How, how can I hand you over Israel? How can I turn you into a Sodom? How can I treat you like a Gomorrah? My heart recoils within me and my compassion is kindled. I will not give vent to my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not man. I am the Holy One in your very midst, and I have not come to destroy. That's the Phillips translation. Well, there's one more thing I'd like to say about Obadiah before we leave it completely. The Edomites lived up in this mountain, and they literally carved their capital in stone. And this book of, of Obadiah suggests that they thought, nobody's going to touch us. We're very safe up here. Uh, this is, you know, how could anyone get to us? Do we ever... Um, talk like we're safe and uh, we're God's true people and nobody could touch us? I see Jane Ann smiling and yes. some other people smiling. You've heard words like that, I think right? we don't have to even 
go as far as us. We can talk about Jerusalem and the people said, God's temple is here. God would never let this temple be destroyed or captured. Jeremiah We're safe. Mm -hmm. yep. And we say the same. It's too big to fail. Yeah, too big. <laughs> that sounds like a financial story, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, the next book that we come to is a book called Jonah. And Jonah is very, even people who know virtually nothing about the Bible at all know about the story of Jonah. What, what happened in the story of Jonah? We need to just briefly recount the story. Remember, God calls him to go to Nineveh. Now, who was Nineveh? Where was Nineveh? What was Nineveh? Capital of Assyria. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, which was what relationship to, to, to Judah? Enemy. Worst enemy. These are the people who would come raiding down and they would wipe out villages and they would wipe out whole sections of the country and then they would go back north and it just seemed like, it seemed like there was nothing anybody could do to stop them. Worst enemies. And so God comes to Jonah, who apparently had a comfortable, uh, well-paying job uh, working for the king in, in Samaria. And God said, you, I want you to go and carry a message for me to the capital of Assyria. And Jonah said, sure, Lord, no problem. I'll go. I'll get right on it, right? Mm -hmm. He says, let me out of this job. I don't want to have anything to do with going to the Syrians. Those people are terrible. I arrive there, they'll beat me up. They'll, what, the, the Assyrians were famous for the fact that they would, they would beat people until they were black and blue. Everything in the body was hurting. And then they would skin them alive. Can you imagine that? Well, as far as Jonah goes, there goes the, the perfect prophet there because he didn't do exactly what God no. wanted him to do. He charged down to Joppa, found a ship that was headed as far from Nineveh as he could possibly go and jumped on. And what happened? Storm came up. A terrible storm came up and where was Jonah? Sleeping, Sleeping in the bottom of the boat, wasn't he? Yeah. Wow sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And the people, the, the sailors up, in, up on top were rowing and they were trying to do, every, bailing, and they were trying to do everything they could to try to save this ship. And they started praying to their pagan gods. And finally someone discovered Jonah down at the bottom of the boat and says, are you still sleeping? Wake up, we're about to die. The whole ship is gonna sink. And what did Jonah say? Throw me overboard. I know why this storm is over. here throw me overboard and everything will be fine. According to the book, they tossed Jonah over. They tried hard to do whatever they could to save Jonah. They said, no, we're all going to go down. So they threw Jonah over the board and how fast did the storm go away? Like that. Calm seas, right? And what happened to Jonah? Spent time in the whale, supposedly. He spent time in a whale. It says three days and three nights. Yeah. A great fish. A great fish, maybe, or a whale, something like that. Somebody, some people think it's a shark. Some people think it's a shark, yeah. Because it's actually happened to people. They didn't just throw Jonah overboard and say, good riddance, buddy. No. They, uh, then the feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Mm -hmm. They made a more religious experience mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, what happened then? Well, Jonah decided it was time to pray. Yeah. yeah. In the belly of the whale, he decided it was time to pray. And next thing he found a very vomiting experience, right? Yeah. The big fish or the whale or whatever spit him out on dry ground. Wow. And some people saw it happen. Apparently. Well, they... It could explain why they were so mm -hmm. interested in what he had to say. Mm -hmm. Somebody came out from a fish, which was part of their gods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about that? Yeah. Somebody, and, and do you think Jonah might have been affected by being in the belly of a whale for that period of time? Physically or even <laughs> spiritually? Physically. Even, <laughs> even physically. 
says he cried from the depths of Sheol. Yeah, so he was the depths of hell. Yes. The, de the, the grave, it says. Sometimes they just have the grave. Mm -hmm. Prophets and Kings says, At last Jonah had learned that salvation belongeth unto the Lord. <laughs> With penitence and recognition of the saving grace of God came the deliverance. Jonah was released from the perils of the mighty deep, was cast out upon the dry land. Yeah. Well, Jonah went back home and God says, you know what? I kind of had the idea that you ought to go to Nineveh. <laughs> Jonah said, what? I'm, okay, I'm this on time. My way. I'm on my way this time. I'm not, no more fish stories from me, right? There's a, there's a couple of very interesting stories that have surfaced about Jonah. Yeah, there's probably a lot of them, but I like this one. A little girl was observed by her pastor standing outside the preschool Sunday school classroom between Sunday school and worship, waiting for her parents to come and pick her up for big church. The pastor noticed that she clutched a big storybook with the title Jonah and the Whale on her arms. He knelt down beside the little girl and began a conversation. What's that you have in your hand, he asked. This is my storybook about Jonah and the whale, she answered. Tell me something, little girl, she, he continued. Do you believe that story about Jonah and that whale to be the truth? The little girl nodded. Why, of course I believe this story to be the truth. He inquired further. You really believe that a man can be swallowed up by a big whale, stay inside him all that time and come out of there still alive and okay? You really believe all that can be true? She declared, absolutely, this story is in the Bible and we studied it in Sunday school today. Then the pastor answered, well, little girl, can you prove to me that this story is the truth? She thought for a moment and then said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. The pastor then asked, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? She then put her hands on her little hips and sternly declared, then you can ask him. <laughs> 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 Another story that's almost as good as that comes from somebody I know personally. A teacher in Idaho asked a group of children what they learned from the story of Jonah. And one child responded, even the fish learn that you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> but there's some very serious messages in the book of Jonah. Everybody knows about Jonah. I'll read from the Message Bible again. Everybody knows about Jonah. People who have never read the Bible know enough about Jonah to laugh at a joke about him and the whale. Jonah has entered our folklore. There is a playful aspect to his story, a kind of slapstick clum clumsiness about Jonah as he bumbles his way along, trying always unsuccessfully to avoid God. But the playfulness is not frivolous. This is deadly serious. While we are smiling or laughing at Jonah, we drop the guard with which we are trying to keep God at a comfortable distance. And suddenly we find ourselves caught in the purposes and commands of God, all of us, no exceptions. Stories are the most prominent biblical way of helping us see ourselves in the God story, which always gets around to the story of God making and saving us. Stories, in contrast to abstract statements of truth, tease us into becoming participants in what, um, in what is being said. We find ourselves involved in the action. We may start out as spectators or critics, but if the story is good, and the stories are very good, we find ourselves no longer just listening, but, to be in, but inhabiting the story. One reason that the Jonah story is so enduringly important for nurturing the life of faith in us is that Jonah is not a hero too big and mighty for us to identify with. He doesn't do anything great. Instead of being held up as an ideal to admire, we find Jonah as a companion in our ineptness. Here is someone on our level. Even when Jonah does it right, like preaching finally in Nineveh, he does it wrong by getting angry at God. But the whole time, God is working within and around Jonah's very ineptness and accomplishing his purposes in him. Most of us need a biblical friend or two like Jonah. What was Jonah's basic problem? <laughs> His basic problem was he didn't like Assyrians, and he didn't think they liked him. He was probably right. Yeah. 
But it, it seems to me like his basic problem was he was totally focused on himself. Yeah. If God was going to send him over there to Syria, they were going to be they were going to give him a bad time. So he wanted to go the other direction. Yeah. He got down there and preached his message, and they responded. And now he's afraid they're going to call him a false prophet, and so mm -hmm. he's worried about that. Mm -hmm. Instead of being grateful and and thankful to God that the message had had an effect on the people, and that yeah. it was. Well, let's let's look at that. Let, try to put yourself in Jonah's shoes for a few minutes. You say, God, you know, please leave me alone. I have a comfortable job here. I work for the king. I'm okay. Just leave me alone. He goes off. He tries to escape. God grabs him and throws him into a tum stomach of a fish or a whale or whatever and vomits him out on the ground. And he crawls back home and God says, uh, Jonah, I had a plan for you. <laughs> and finally Jonah says, okay, seriously, God, what do you want me to do? Go there and preach to Nineveh because I tell them I'm going to destroy the whole city. I guess he should ask the question, why? Why are you going there? And he might have got the answer back. I love those people. I created them. They're my people. Go help them out. Well, but, but listen to my story here for a moment. God says, go and tell the Ninevites, I'm going to destroy the whole city. So Jonah stops and he thinks for a moment, you know, if I can go up there single-handedly to the city of Nineveh and follow God's directions and wipe out the entire city of Nineveh and come back, I will be a conquering hero, right? Okay. Defeated the enemy. Defeated the, the worst enemy of all, the whole world at that point in time. Wiped out the whole city. So he thought, well, uh, that wouldn't be a bad thing, right? Verse 2 of my self-centeredness. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes up and what sermon did he preach? God's going to destroy this place in 40 days. And okay. I'm starting the countdown. Yeah. A whole, his entire message is, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's all we know about his message. In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. And what was the result? 100% acceptance. The greatest evangelist of, of all time. Uh, ancient, ancient times, at least. This is a marvel. And who was the one who made the biggest impact uh, there in, in Nineveh? The people, of, read, ver, read chapter 3, verse 5. The yeah. people of Nineveh believed God's message. So they decided that everyone should fast and all the people from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth to show that they had re repented. When the king of Nineveh heard about it, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. He sent out a proclamation to the people of Nineveh. This is an order from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink. All persons and animals must wear sackcloth. Everyone must pray earnestly to God, notice that's capital G, and must give up their wicked behavior and their evil actions. Perhaps God will change his mind. Perhaps he will stop being angry and we will not die. Before they run out of time. Before they run out of time, yeah. So they had some idea about wicked actions. Yes. Figured we better get rid of this. But there's something there that worries me a little bit. Is God in the practice of changing his mind? That's what he sent Jonah down there for. <laughs> <laughs> to get them to, to, for him to change his mind or for them to change their mind? Uh, they change their mind. You're going to have to wait for the answer to that till we come back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We were there with Jonah in the city. And he convinces even the king that this is a very serious possibility that the entire city is going to be destroyed. Now, it's hard to imagine. You're, 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 you're going up against a nation whose God is a God of war. The only nation in the world at that point in time that, that had a professional army. We're not talking about volunteers like all the other nations had. We're talking about a professional army. One man shows up, marches through the streets up and down and says, God's coming to destroy the city. And the whole place repents. Well, don't you think that the story of the fish and the storm and so forth followed Jonah to Nineveh? And don't you think he's... Or him, maybe even. Uh, and maybe he spoke with, with, with extra eloquence. He might even have some seaweed around his shoulders. <laughs> or some... Or some patches of white where the yes. stomach has started to digest his skin or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, well, mm -hmm. let's, let's put, we're, we're saying God is maybe going to change his mind. L let's look at that for a moment. Uh, what do we do with, with um, Malachi chapter 3 and it should be verse 6, I believe. Uh, hold on here, just a sec. 3 6, yes. Yeah, okay. Next page. I am the Lord, I do not change. I sent my man down there and I told him, Tell the Ninevites, you're going to die. So it's finished. No, end of story, right? Well, look at another place. That Is that, was that God's promise? He sent Jonah hundreds of miles up there to tell him. Why would he send Jonah to tell him about it if he wasn't open to changing his mind? You know, if there was nothing they could do that would uh, seek God's repentance, oh. so well, why so send Jonah? Jonah could come back and say, look, I single-handedly conquered the Assyrians. That doesn't seem to be how God works. <laughs> you don't think that's how God works? Well, look at 1 Samuel 15. Maybe it'll give us some insight into this business of uh, God changing his mind. 1 Samuel 15. And I'll start with verses 10 and 11. And here's, we're talking about the story of Saul and, and uh, his ex exploits. The Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry I made Saul king. He has turned away from me and disobeyed my commands. Samuel was angry and all night long he pleaded with the Lord. I am sorry that I made Saul king. Was that a mistake on God's part? I'm sorry the way it turned out. I don't like the way it turned out. I see. Well, he, he, was, he didn't know in advance it was going to turn out like that? He did. Okay. He, was sorry he was still unhappy the way it turned too. out. A few verses later, if you come down to verse 29, in that same chapter exactly, it says, Israel's majestic God does not lie or change his mind. He is not a human being. He does not change his mind. Well, maybe we, he didn't. We just read, just I'm, sorry I made, I'm sorry I made Saul king. It still doesn't mean he changed his mind. He was sorry he made Saul king even before he made him king? No, he's, he wasn't. He didn't change his mind. He just did, he did it anyway, and he was still sorry. Maybe he was and sorry that Saul was the only one repentance. available. Change direction. I thought I think God is sorry every time we sin, mm -hmm. and he it's the activities of humanity that make him sorry. Well, you read on six more verses. We're now to verse thirty-five in First Samuel fifteen. As long as Samuel lived, he never again saw the king, but he grieved over him. The Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king of Israel. The Lord is sorry he made Saul king of Israel. He doesn't change his mind. He's sorry he made king, Saul king of Israel. Now, just because he's sorry, does that mean if he had it, uh, the do-over again, he would do it differently? I don't think so. I'm asking so. you, what, what does this verse mean? Jane Ann. I think God is sorry that Israel demanded a king. Mm -hmm. And God gave them the kind of king they wanted. And I think he was sorry the whole time. 
back in, in the days of Moses, mm -hmm. he, he presented, if you do these, if you obey the will of the Lord, all of these good things will happen to you. If you don't, all of these bad things are going to happen to you. <laughs> over and over and back over and, and over he goes like that. To the place where you, you think when he deals with humanity, all of his promises are conditional. Mm -hmm. And what he says he's going to do or what he's not going to do depends on what we do. Well, looking at the story of Jonah again, what happened? He says, well, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to wait. And I'm going to watch this with my own eyes from the hillside. And then I'm going to be able to go back and report. I did it. And what happened? God says, I guess I won't destroy you, Nineveh. They repented. And Jonah says, what? You can't do that. Who gave you permission to do that? And now Jonah go home and, and, and goes home and, and, and what, are, what are all his friends are going to say? You beat him, didn't you? You conquered the Assyrians. You destroyed the whole city of Nineveh, right? Uh, no. They're all still there. As a matter of fact, they are believing God. They are serving Him. Aren't you glad? <laughs> well, that's not quite what Jonah said. That's what he should have said. Jonah replied, look at verses 9 of, of, in following of, of chapter 4 of, of Jonah. But God said to him, I'm start with, yeah, with verse 9. But God said to him, what right do you have to be angry about the plant? Remember, there's a plant that came up and provided him some shade, and then the, a worm ate the plant and it died. Jonah replied, I have every right to be angry, angry enough to die. Now, he didn't really care that much about the plant. He was angry that, that he was going to end up going back home as a false prophet. The Lord said to him, this plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it, and you didn't make it grow, yet you feel sorry for it. How much more, then, should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city, after all, it has more than 120 thousand innocent children in it as well as many animals. Nineveh was one of the great cities of the Old Testament times. It had walls that were 100 feet high and 50 feet thick. Imagine trying to attack a wall like that with a, you know, with human... With rocks. Yeah, rocks <laughs> and, and spears and swords. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'd like to take on one more book before our time runs out. Yes. Give us just a little bit of history about Nineveh of 100 years later and so on, or are you coming? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. In Nineveh the, is yeah. going to be destroyed sometime later. Uh, let me, let, I can tell you a little bit about Nineveh, which would be appropriate. Well, just, isn't uh, Syria the nation that, that came and destroyed all of the northern kingdom of Israel, took yes. them all into captivity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and destroyed almost all of uh, Judea except Jerusalem and yes. 100, what was it, 100,000 Assyrians? 185,000 of the Assyrians died because of God's hand. Yeah. yeah, a prominent Assyrian city on the east bank of the Tigris River, about 280 miles north of Babylon. Nineveh is founded by Nimrod along with Rehobothir, Kela, and Rezin, forming a massive urban quadrangle <laughs> 60 miles across. It rivaled Babylon for beauty and splendor with its royal palaces, temples, broad streets, public gardens, and impressive library containing more than 26,000 clay tablets that we're still deciphering. One of the largest in the ancient world. Defended by an outer wall and an inner wall 100 feet high and 50 feet wide, I've already told you about that. Irrigated by the Akasa River, whose flow is controlled by a dam built by Sennacherib and also by a large aqueduct that carried water from the second dam 30 miles away. Target of prophecies by Zephaniah and Nahum, we'll talk about those later, who warned of the city's ultimate destruction. It was destroyed in 612 AD by a siege of Babylonians, Scythians, and Medes who penetrated its defenses when sudden, sudden floods eroded the walls. So who was responsible for destroying Nineveh, basically? God. God. It quickly became a mound of ruins that was ignored until just a century ago. That was the end of the great city of Nineveh. So let's go to Micah. Let's take a look. We're, remember, we're just doing a quick overpass here just to sort of get an idea of, 
of these things and try to see what they tell us about, my, about God. Micah was another one of those prophets that were a part of the four that prophesied at the same time, Micah and Amos, Isaiah and Hosea, um, about the same time in, in Israelite and Judean history. A couple of them were prophesying in the north and a couple of them were prophesied, prophesying in the south. And there was three huge, huge, world-changing kind of events that happened during uh, Micah's reign. In 734-732 BC, Tiglath-Pileser III, obviously from Assyria, from Nineveh, led a campaign against parts of Israel and Judah, as well as Syria and the land of the Philistines. Assyria won a resounding victory. All the nations had to pay tribute, but the northern kingdom of Israel suffered the most and lost most of its territory. So it's already, you know, basically down to vassal status. And uh, ten years later, 722-721 B.C., Shalmaneser V of Assyria besieged the northern kingdom's capital of Samaria. The city eventually fell to Sargon II and large numbers of its inhabitants were deported. Three, during the reign of Hezekiah in 701 B.C., now we're twenty years later again, Judah unwisely joined a revolt against Assyria. King Sennacherib overran much of the territory, but Jerusalem was spared in the end. Micah's book must be read in light of these events. And why was it that Jerusalem wasn't wiped out? Big wall. Hmm? A big wall. A big wall, but more than that, what else was involved? Angel, well, 185,000 yeah. Assyrians died yeah. one night. Yeah. Okay. Uh, read about that in just very briefly in Isaiah chapter 37. And it tells the whole story if you read about the, the threats, etc. But then verse, Isaiah 37, starting with verse 36, An angel of the Lord went to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 soldiers. At dawn the next day, there they lay, all dead. Then the Assyrian emperor Sennacherib withdrew and returned to Nineveh, one day when he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, two of his sons, Adramelech and Cherezer, killed him with their swords and then escaped to the land of Ararat. Another of his sons, Esarhaddon, succeeded him as emperor. So that was basically the demise of the great Assyrian army and its world-dominating power. So what was Micah doing during this time? Once again, we're talking about a time when there was this shocking difference between the very rich and the very poor, the oppressed poor. Um, and there was this almost nothing in between because the middle class had been pretty much wiped out by oppression by the greedy landholders, etc. Remember that God's original plan was what was supposed to happen to each parcel of land? Supposed to stay in the family forever. It was supposed to belong to a family and it was supposed to be passed down and stay in that family forever. But now the greedy landowners were grabbing up huge chunks of land and, and uh, doing this. Because of this failed leadership, the whole nation became morally corrupt and ripe for judgment. Now I'm going to uh, read a few words again from the introduction to Micah in the in the. Uh, uh, message Bible, prophets use words to remake the world. The world, heaven and earth, men and women, animals and birds, was made in the first place by God's word. Prophets arriving on the scene and finding that world in ruins, finding a world of moral rubble and spiritual disorder, take up the word, the work of words again to rebuild what human disobedience and mistrust demolished. These prophets learn their, spe their speech from God. Their words are God-grounded, God-energized, God-passionate. As their words enter the language of our communities, men and women find themselves in the presence of God who enters the mess of human sin to rebuke and renew. Left to ourselves, we turn God into an object, something we can deal with, something we can use to our benefit, whether that thing is a feeling or an idea or an image. Prophets scorn all such stuff. They train us to respond to God's presence and voice. Micah, the final member of that powerful quartet of writing prophets who burst on the world scene in the 8th century BC, including Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos, 
like virtually all his fellow prophets, those charged with keeping people alive to God and alert to listening to the voice of God, was a master of metaphor. This means that he used words not simply to define or identify what can be seen, touched and smelled, heard or tasted, but to plunge us into a world of presence. To experience presence is to enter that far larger world of reality that our sensory experiences point to but cannot describe. The realities of love and compassion, justice and faithfulness, sin and evil, and God. Mostly God. The realities that are that are word evoked are where most of the world's action takes place. There are no mere words. So just a little idea about Micah. What do we find in Micah that uh, would lead to that kind of a conclusion? There are several passages. One of, one of the very interesting ones is found in Micah 4, verses 11 and 12. Let me read that for you. Many nations have gathered to attack you. They say, Jerusalem must be destroyed. We will see this city in ruins. But these nations do not know what is in the Lord's mind. They do not realize that they have been gathered together to be punished in the same way that grain is brought in to be threshed. What do you think the Ninevites thought when they went down to conquer Jerusalem, conquer Israel, conquer Samaria? Did they think they were being sent by Yahweh? No. No. Is God deceiving us here by suggesting that he's the one who makes all these plans? If you believe in monotheism, yes. Not, he's not deceiving us. I see. He's responsible. Okay. And even today, we would say yes, in a passive sense at least. Mm -hmm. God could have done something about it, and he didn't. And he didn't. Was, were these nations, and we're going we're gonna to talk about Babylon a little bit later uh, in a future class, Nineveh here and Babylon later, were they carrying out God's plans? What did Daniel say? Talking even about Medo-Persia, he said, Cyrus is my servant, right? Mm -hmm. My anointed. I'm, my anointed. I'm going to send, and then in other spots, even in Jeremiah, I'm going to send Babylon. To clean up the mess, sort of. So, is God working behind the scenes? What's going on here? Helping his creation, as well as the heavenly beings, understand how evil works. Yeah. And then the next, the next few verses down, there's something very interesting. People of Jerusalem, gather your forces. I'm reading chapter 5, verse 1. We are besieged. They are attacking the leader of Israel. The Lord says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are one of the smallest towns in Judah, but out of you I will bring a ruler for Israel whose family line goes back to ancient times. What's that talking about? Prophecy of Jesus' birth. What does that have to do with what's going on 800 years earlier, 700 years earlier in, in the days of Micah? He's just, he's just given an indication that things are under his control even though okay. it doesn't look like it. What he's saying is that even though it might even look like you're going to be completely wiped out by the Assyrians, no, 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 no. I have plans for you hundreds of years down the line, right? So let, let's, let's take another couple of places from Mike here. Look at Mike. The, the, How do the people who don't believe in God's foreknowledge deal with that? Well, they just the say they interpret it as something else. Yeah, you know, Jesus. They, they, yeah, you know. But that's a very clear. I mean, if you put it together with other passages, it, would say, it says there where he's going to be born, yeah. when he's going to be born. Long put it together with Daniel, it tells exactly when he's going to be born. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how you. You know how you can put, set that aside. The most famous passage in Micah, of course, is Micah six six to eight. Let's look at that for a moment. Actually, let me start with verse 1. Listen to the Lord's case against Israel. Arise, O Lord, and present your case. Let the mountains and the hills hear what you, have, what you say. You mountains, you everlasting foundations of the earth, listen to the Lord's case. The Lord has a case against his people. He is going to bring an accusation against who? Israel. 
The Lord says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I been a burden to you? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt. I rescued you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead you. My people, remember what King Balaam of Moab planned to do to you and how Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. Remember the things that happened on the way from camp at Acacia to Gilgal. Remember these things and you will realize what I did in order to save you. And then what's the response? What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn as offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? I mean, you know, thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil, that's pretty pricey stuff, right? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Practical godliness. Huh? Practical godliness. Prophets and Kings has a nice word on that. Mm -hmm. In urging the value of practical godliness, the prophet was only repeating the counsel given Israel centuries before. From age to age, these counsels were repeated by the servants of Jehovah to those who were in danger of falling into habits of formalism and of forgetting to show mercy. We should lose no opportunity of performing deeds of mercy, of tender forethought, Christian courtesy for the burdened and the oppressed. Yeah, exactly. So, and so what was the accusation that God had against his people and what was the case he had? I mean, reading this part. Yeah. Wh I mean, what? Does, it, does it say it straight out or do you have to derive it from reading? Well, what, 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 do you, what, do you, what does it sound like? What, is he, what does he want from us? What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Clearly, they weren't doing that. So the case was they weren't doing that? Yeah. Okay. They weren't doing those things. They were oppressing the poor. They were wiping out the middle class because they were stealing their land. They were doing all kinds of stuff. And it was, yeah, they were not, they were not respecting God at all. They had forgotten practical godliness. Mm -hmm. So you do have to derive the accusation from what he said there. Yeah, but it's pretty straight. You don't have to. It doesn't take very much interpretive power to <laughs> see what he's talking. Because it seems like when you make a case, you you present the evidence, mm -hmm. whatever, and it looks like he just he said the opposite of the evidence. Gary, to, if you go on down here to verse eleven. Mm -hmm. How can I forgive those who use false scales and weights? You rich people exploit the poor, and all of you are liars. So he, he's, Straight from Amos. He's, he's a little more pointed just a few verses later. Yeah. Okay, that's a well, good well, answer. One of the other prophets of that time, what we've already studied, is Isaiah. Look at Isaiah 1, starting with verse 10, and see if this gives us a clue of what's going on. Jerusalem, your rulers and your people are like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Pay attention to what our God is teaching you. He says, do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me? See, the idea at that point was, we can do whatever we want during the week, just as so long as we pile up sacrifices on the weekend, come to church, put in our appearance. Do the rituals. Do the rituals. Well, actually pay for it. Yeah, exactly. Anytime. Yeah. <laughs> He says, do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me? I have had more than enough of the sheep you burn as sacrifices and of the fat of your fine animals. I am tired of the blood of bulls and sheep and goats. Who asked you to bring me all this when you come to worship me? Who asked you to do all this tramping around in my temple? It's useless to bring your offerings. I'm disgusted with the smell of the incense you burn. I mean, does that sound like Deuteronomy and Leviticus? The Lord had a smell, a sweet smell, right? Mm. I cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths, and your religious gatherings. You're all corrupted by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals and holy days, and they are a burden that I am tired of bearing. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. 
See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights and defend widows. The Lord says, now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin, but I will wash you as clean as snow. Although your stains are deep red, you will be as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will eat the good things the land produces. But if you defy me, you are doomed to die. I, the Lord, have sp spoken. So what, what have we learned from these four or five short books that we've talked about? We've learned several things. First of all, we learned that God is concerned about all the nations around. We specifically had a focus on Nineveh. We had a focus on Edom. God is concerned. Whole books were written focusing on those other nations. We've learned that God cares about what we do all week long, not just what we happen to do in church on the weekend. We have learned that uh, people can, can deceive themselves to think that if they come to church and go through the ceremonies on the weekend, it doesn't matter so much what they do all week long. And God makes it very clear, I, I think we could fairly say from these last few verses we looked at, that that's absolutely not true. We've learned that God uses situations, a plague of locusts, uh, uh, the Nineveh situation, uh, you know, the, 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 the story of the whale, etc. God uses situations like that to grab our attention and tell us something about Him. So what about our time? Do these books tell us anything? Do any of us in our day, do any human beings oppress the poor and take advantage of other people and then go to church on the weekend and say, look at my nice suit that I just bought from the fancy store because I have money by oppressing the poor. No, I guess we don't say that part, do we? There's even songs about it. Songs about it. Sunday morning Christians. Sunday morning Christians, yeah. So. Uh, we have a f only a few of these little books left to, to finish the Old Testament, and I think we're going to find more of the same stuff. But I think it's a challenge in these books to us, for us. There's, there's a specific message for each one of these little books, and, and I hope that you've gotten some idea what those specific messages are. Primarily, God cares about what we do every day in our everyday lives. See you next week.